Welcome to International Securities Exchange's podcast series, facilitated by renowned educators. ISE podcasts are intended to teach beginning as well as seasoned investors the ins and outs of trading. To find an updated list of podcasts, please visit www.isc.com slash podcasts. Please be sure to listen to our important message following this episode regarding the risks of investing in exchange-traded options. What about TLT? What was that? I forgot. Oh, I yeah, right. of- TLT, that's right. TLT is an, is an ETF. Uh, that represents the longer-term treasuries. That one actually is getting – I forgot about that one. Thanks for reminding me. TLT is an, e, an ETF that represents the 7- to 20-year treasuries. Uh, so if you wanted to trade options on that, that one is a, – it's a bond ETF that actually is starting to get some decent liquidity to it. If you're looking to trade uh, the bond ETF options like LQD for the corporate bonds or – uh, TIP for the uh, the ETF that tracks the the tips. It's you're not going to get a lot of liquidity on it. Typically, what would probably be the best way to go, or the reason that people that I've seen people actually trading options on those is if you want to own the underlying and have like a cash secured put, or maybe do a covered call that you know you're going to hold till expiration. For short term trading, those are difficult unless it is TLT. Another point from Andrew. And he says, um, why don't hedgies use FX for negative correlation portfolios? What's interesting is that uh, for those of you uh, that have been following FX, because I watch it very closely, uh, this Chinese bank about two months ago, maybe even a little bit less, it, uh, it was announced that they had lost in excess of $2 billion uh, by these Chinese bank had shorted um, the U.S. dollar against the Australian dollar. So effectively, in fact, I did the math, they shorted the 115 call. They didn't do it at the ISC, but they did it on another exchange. Or I don't actually, they, I think they did, they did it off exchange, but they effectively sold the 115 call naked. Uh, and the reason that they did that was they wanted the income that was going to come in, and they had a plenty of money because they're a large bank, so they sold the 115 call naked. If you take a look, and I think AUX is trading at around 158, so they lost, uh, whatever that is, 40 points or so, which is probably about $3 billion. And the reason that they don't, you know, Andrew, as you say, why don't these hedges do, uh, hedge? Because they're basically, like all of us, we start to look at the rate of return on our account, if we're right, instead of looking at the rate of return or the, or the return of our money if we're wrong. So that's a very good point, Andrew. Mike, do you have anything to add on that about looking at risk and reward? And Well, it, it gets back to what you're talking about. Know your risk. Three questions that I always ask myself personally and why I recommend to people before any trade, and I don't mean to insult people's intelligence, and if I do, I apologize, but uh, what am I going to do if the stock goes up? What am I going to do if the stock goes down? What am I going to do if the stock stays the same? And that goes for currencies, futures, whatever you're trading. And if you're taking notes, I always tell people, underline the words going to 15 times. If you have a plan before you get into the trade, that's great. Now, for some people that shorted puts on Apple at 100 and they wanted to own Apple at 100 when it was at 120, hey, that's fine. Nothing wrong with that whatsoever if you're if you're willing to hold it for the longer-term period of time. Because uh, I believe Apple's around $80 right now. But uh, the fact that you're saying, wow, that's really juicy premium, I'm going to sell the Apple 100 puts uh, because they're – because there's no way Apple's going to get that low, well, you need to be prepared for it. If you're an option seller, you need to be prepared to take on your obligations. And a lot of people, like you're saying, only look at the rate of return side of it. When you're a premium seller, yeah, you get the premium, and it's a wonderful thing, don't get me wrong, but you're taking on an obligation. And if you're not prepared to take on that obligation, whether it's through a stop loss, whether it's through a spread, or whether it's through uh, some type of plan to maybe short the stock if it gets to that level, however exotic or however simple you want to be, uh, you're going to get burned if you don't have a plan. The people that stick in this, that stay around in this business are the ones that have a plan. The ones that blow out their accounts too quickly are the ones that uh, I, I hate to say it, but just quite frankly, uh, throw caution to the wind and just look at how much money they can make. Andrew said that he was just thinking of FX as part of a larger portfolio. That's right. In fact, a lot of these institutions are starting to do that. Look at trading uh, FX as a non-correlated asset. And as Mike pointed out, um, you know, we see that uh, there wasn't a lot of correlation. And if let's just say you like trading iron condors or you like to trade butterflies or 
you like to buy, you know, uh, strangles or straddles or sell strangles or straddles. It didn't look like uh, the correlation was high r relative to the U.S. stock market. In fact, um, one could argue, uh, at least against the Australian dollar, that it actually could actually it, it may actually be reversed. There isn't a lot of correlation. I think that's the whole point, right, Mike? That you know you want to find the option strategy that works. I think so, and, 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 I'll, and I'll tell you a story. I know a guy that <clears throat> actually I know one guy pretty well. He's a, a long-term bull on the stock market, but he loves the idea of being a premium seller. And you know he's done some covered calls and things like that, but he just was having a hard time kind of separating himself, a condor trader slash short strangle trader, but he just couldn't do it on the indices. Now he actually does it on the interest rates or on on, on the ten year and, and a couple other the treasuries. But nonetheless, what you could do is let's say right now, hopefully tonight we or just maybe tonight you, you and when you do your research on your own, your own, you see okay, I see no correlation between, and I'm just making one up of the uh, the Swiss franc and the U.S stock market, let's say. And let's say that you're a long-term U.S. stock market bull uh, that's ingrained in your brain and you have just have a hard time buying puts. Well, maybe in this market, the last three months it's not so hard, but let's say just throughout time you have a hard time with that mentality. But you want to be neutral, you want to do condors, you want to... Uh, you don't want to necessarily root for the market to stay still for the purpose of one part of your portfolio and then root for it to go up for the long part of your portfolio. One thing you can do is just do your iron condors or do your strangles or do uh, your diagonal spreads from a neutral standpoint on the currencies. You can do the same thing or the same concept with the euro, the yen, the British pound. You can use these ISC options. And uh, what's cool about is the flexibility that's involved. You can do these things in an IRA. You could do these in a, a Coverdale college savings account if you want to. You could even do them in a health savings account. So uh, the flexibility is definitely there. And if you want to get something kind of aside, you want to take a step back, this is where I want to collect my income. And over on the stock side of it, that's where I want to get my capital gains. That could be a good way of looking at it. If anybody has, you know, I think we're going to wrap this up in the next two or three minutes. But if you have any other questions, um, please just type them in. Uh, I see a question from Faye about, I guess it's an option synthetics about buying a put versus um, I'm sorry, married put versus buying a call. Mike, do you just want to comment on synthetics in general? Yeah, briefly. There's always there's always a, a mere strategy. Like theoretically, a bull call spread and a bull put spreads the exact same thing. Uh, buying the stock is the exact same thing as selling a put and buying a call with the same strike price. Theoretic. I mean, it, it's not always going to work out exactly like this. But theoretically, it's the same thing. So let's say, for example, you just wanted to uh, own. The, the U.S. dollar, so to speak, versus the euro, one thing that you could do is sell an at-the-money put and then buy an at-the-money call, and it would just be almost identical to owning that uh, underlying that we saw on the screenshot at 79.55. That's a good point. If you want to learn more about it, you know, Options Synthetics, there's plenty of places, optionseducation.org, the ISC, Options Express. They all do a great, uh, do excellent work as far as teaching those kind of concepts. Uh, one other point I want to just oh, – here's one question from George. When trading FX options, what kind of spread between the bid and ask should you expect? Well, the spreads are going to be dictated by how volatile the underlier is. In fact, that's a good – the volatility in all these pairs when we first started trading about 18 months ago was somewhere between the 5 to 8 or 9 percent volatility. If you look – if you go to Option Express, if, if you're a, a customer there or – if you're not, you can go to a site called LiveVol, uh, where you, you can go check out the volatilities. You're going to see the volatilities today are going to be somewhere between 20 and 45 percent. So they're you know four to whatever five, six, seven times greater than they were. So the bid ask spreads in the options market are going to reflect that, George. And that and you're probably seeing that in Google and IBM. Bid ask spreads are wider everywhere. It's because the underlying market is a bit more volatile, and um, that just seems to make sense, but I think you're going to see the bid ask spreads narrow, hopefully as the market volatility starts to drop a bit. But volatility is really, really important. In fact, if you trade spreads, as Mike was just showing you, you can actually uh, take a lot of that volatility risk out of the trade. Uh, Mike, I want to say thank you. You know, you were uh, just did a great job. I know you spent a lot of time on this low correlation alternative to the equity market, looking at gold, you know, looking at crude, looking at even at some equities. And I think that um, you gave the audience something, some knowledge that they can chew on, they can take back to their computer, 
and think about it. And, you know, again, taking time out of your Sunday, uh, as Mike was, a, a, you know, Sunday's football, at least for me, and I think for Mike, Mike actually played for the Buffalo Bills for a bit. It was, it was a ton of fun, Steve. I had a lot of fun uh, doing research for this webinar, and it, I had a lot of fun. Please trade with limited risk as markets can and will change. Uh, and I think Mike uh, brought that point out. So, uh, Mike, thanks again on the behalf of the International Securities Exchange and uh, your host, Steve Meisinger. Uh, thanks again. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for listening to our podcast. To find more podcasts on options, stocks, alternative markets, and market data, please visit www.isc.com slash podcasts.